Hello, everybody, and welcome to Green Time TV. I'm the host today, Dr. Larry Kyle, and we are going to be talking about a most interesting topic, psychotropic drugs and the environment. Uh, but first, we're going to watch an interesting DVD called Marketing of Madness. Psychiatrists have long desired to be viewed on a par with medical professionals. But whereas regular physicians have diagnostic tests to prove or disprove illness, psychiatrists do not. There is no objective testing in psychiatry. There is no blood test. There is no urine test. There is no biopsy. There's nothing that objectively proves that there's anything physiologically or biochemically wrong that's creating your symptoms. With cancer, you can do a screening and it's there or not. You can look at the cells and you can tell if it's there. Uh, different diseases, you can, you can look at it and you can see it under a microscope or you can see it in an MRI or you can see it in a CAT scan. With mental health, you can't see it. You can't be diagnosed in a medical procedure. It's all subjective. So the question becomes, without any scientific lab tests showing the presence or absence of mental problems, how does psychiatry's diagnostic system work? And how did it become so prevalent? Psychiatry's search for scientific grounding has been going on for well over a century. In the late 19th century, German psychiatrist Emil Kreplin was the first to attempt to classify mental problems as medical disease states. Though he devoted his life attempting to prove that these problems came exclusively from biological and hereditary sources, he never could finally concluding it was nearly impossible to scientifically distinguish the normal from the insane. In spite of Kreplin's findings, psychiatrists persisted, with many efforts at classification throughout the years resulting in the first edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, published by the American Psychiatric Association in 1952. A small, spiral-bound, 130-page handbook DSM-1 described 112 so-called mental disorders based not on standard scientific procedure, but contributions from a write-in ballot mailed to 10% of the APA's member psychiatrists. With the release of its second edition in 1968, the DSM had now grown to 145 disorders, still not based on any science, though packed with theories on the origins of its illnesses. But with the sudden surge in popularity of psychiatric drugs such as Milltown and Valium among the general public, the psychiatric community realized that a biological explanation to justify prescribing them had to be found. And they found it in a paper written by psychiatrist Dr. Joseph Schildkraut. Though he had no means of discovering what normal brain chemistry should consist of, Schildkraut theorized that mental problems might be caused by a biochemical imbalance of neurotransmitters in the brain. It's a great line, the chemical imbalance. Um, there's no evidence for it. There, there is no way you can measure or document that such a thing occurs uh, in the first place. There are no lab tests to see what your neurotransmitter levels are or how much you need and, and how off your balance is. Chemical imbalance sounds good, sounds scientific, but whereas, you know, there, as, as we know, there's, there isn't any way to measure what the balance is. There is no identifiable chemical imbalance in the human brain other than the chemical imbalance that comes from putting a medication in that brain. And um, so we've been sold that there's a chemical imbalance, but there's no science to back that up. Though Schildkraut was never able to prove his chemical imbalance theory, it was too late. The psychiatric community had already adopted the theory as a plausible sounding medical explanation for the mental disorders listed in the DSM. But without a test confirming a chemical imbalance, psychiatrists were still bedeviled by a severe inconsistency of diagnosis. Not only that, but psychiatrists were often unable to tell the sane from the insane. This point was driven home in 1972 in the famous Rosenhan experiment, where a total of eight perfectly healthy volunteers 
each presented themselves at a mental institution, claiming to hear voices in their head that only said the words empty, hollow, or thud. No other psychiatric symptoms were stated. The result, each of the volunteers, including Dr. David Rosenhan himself, was immediately committed into the institution. The moment we were admitted to the hospital, we abandoned our symptom and we behaved the way we usually behave. The question was, would anyone detect that we were sane? The answer was, no, no one ever did. All but one was diagnosed as schizophrenic. They were only discharged after admitting they were indeed mentally ill and in remission. After learning of the experiment, the psychiatric community was furious. One hospital challenged Rosenhan to send in more volunteers, promising to catch every one of the fake patients. Three months later, they proudly announced that of 193 patients presenting themselves, they had turned away over 41 who were pretending mental illness and considered another 42 suspect. The problem was Dr. Rosenhan hadn't sent in a single person. 70 years later, Emil Kreplin's conclusion that psychiatry could not distinguish sanity from insanity had once again been proven correct. In his study, Rosenhan concluded, any diagnostic process that lends itself too readily to massive errors of this sort cannot be a very reliable one. Hello everybody again and welcome back to Green Time TV. I'm here with Dr. Don Fitz, another psychologist, also an environmentalist, uh, who has many interests in what we're going to be talking about today. And I thought we would start out, Don, with a question I'm going to ask you after review of that DVD that our audience saw. Uh, was there anything about what we saw that you would like to comment on? Yeah, well, even before that, I want to say it's interesting to be in the guest chair because so, <laughs> so many times I'm in the host chair. Yes. And people who watch the show are used to, used to seeing me as host, but I like to talk about these things myself. Yeah, I really like the idea that the DVD was saying that there's no real physical evidence for some, for psychological problems. You know, it's mm -hmm. like you, you can't do a bone scan, you can't do a blood test, a urine test. You can't, if there's an imbalance of chemicals, you can't look at the chemicals. And, and see the, what there is. But they also, they went into detail about the Rosenhan experiment that I thought was really, really interesting. And that's where he got people to go into the hospital and to, they only had one symptom. They said, I heard voices that say empty, hollow, thud. And it wasn't surprising that they got admitted because people, if they have distress, maybe they should be admitted. But what was, was surprising that they received a diagnosis and they received medication. The people received medication even though they never said, I'm feeling unhappy, I'm feeling discomfort. And so that really indicates a huge tendency of psychiatry to medicate people with any sort of problem that they describe. Without taking a real history. With, all right, without, ta without having sufficient information to know that this person is really in distress and really experiencing severe pain, mm -hmm. they were still given medications. Indeed. Mm -hmm. What else did the uh, DVD bring to mind? Well, th that was one of the points, but the thing that I really want to mention is that when you use so many drugs, people tend to think that drugs are neutral. You know, that it's, it's sort of your choice whether to take the drug or not, and we need to think about the environmental consequences of manufacturing and producing so many drugs. A friend of mine, Stan Cox, uh, uh, showed the, uh, wrote this book, Sick Planet, Corporate Food and Medicine, which has a really good description of what it means to have, um, for people to, to, to be manufacturing so many drugs. He describes going to India, where there's miles and miles of what used to be farmland, used to be natural area, and instead of having farmland or natural area, what this, what's happened is that the it, there's so much effluent or chemicals coming out of the manufacturing plant that you really can't grow anything. The area is dead. The, the rivers have actually turned purple mm. in, in, instead of blue. And there's piles <coughs> of yellowish orange effluent on the, on the, on the John, side. We're kind of coming to a close for this segment. And okay. We can continue. Okay, great. It wasn't just the embarrassment of the Rosenhan experiment that caused psychiatry's leadership to take a new approach to diagnosis. With the rapid expansion in the psychotropic drug business, 
psychiatry underwent a seismic shift in the way it promoted mental illness. And the third edition of the DSM, spearheaded by psychiatrist Dr. Robert Spitzer, took a decidedly brain-based biological approach. Unlike its predecessors, the proposed DSM-3 assumed that mental problems derived from physical abnormalities of the brain. And instead of describing possible psychological causes for mental distress, DSM-3 would simply provide clinicians with checklists of symptoms. However, these descriptions were broad enough to apply to anyone at any time of life. With no science to back them up, these newly proposed disorders and the checklists that went with them were subject to intense negotiation, compromise, alteration, and heated debate. Psychiatrist David Schaffer, who attended the DSM-3 conference, observed, People would shout out their opinions from all sides of the room, and whoever shouted loudest tended to be heard. My own impression, as coming straight from England, was it was more like a tobacco auction than a sort of conference. Many committees are established to determine what should and shouldn't go into the DSM, uh, the current revision. And a lot of the committee activity is based upon, could be personal bias, political pressure, uh, the trend that may be in vogue then, and other things that are non-medical. Well, in the DSM, I mean, they vote in diseases. I mean, they, they get together, the panel of psychiatrists look and decide, is this a disease or is this not a disease? How many of you agree this should be a disease? They have a show of hands. They said 20 people in the room, 12 vote for it, 8 vote against it, bingo. They have a disease. Tell me that that's science. One psychologist reported that during discussions of the proposed criteria for masochistic personality disorder, Spitzer's wife protested about one symptom of the disorder, to which Spitzer responded, okay, take it out. Scientific or not, once a disorder is voted into the DSM, it is very hard to vote it out. On rare occasions, however, this too has occurred. Homosexuality, a mental illness according to DSM 1 and 2. After gay rights activists picketed their 1973 convention, the American Psychiatric Association buckled to political pressure and decided by a mail-in ballot of its member psychiatrists to remove it from DSM's next edition. What happened? It wasn't like, you know, there's some objective evidence that, that at one point it was a disease and we cured the disease and that's a lifestyle choice. No, it was cultural. You know, we became more liberal in this country and decided, okay, it's fine. Whereas, you know, 50, 100 years ago, it wasn't fine, it was a problem. But you, that's not medicine. That's something else. And the psychiatrists who wrote the DSM-3 knew it, as Robert Spitzer would admit to the BBC many years later. What happened is that we made uh, estimates of prevalence of mental disorders totally descriptively, which out consi without considering that many of these conditions might be normal reactions, which are not really disorders. That, that's the problem. But instead of learning from their mistakes, the American Psychiatric Association published the DSM-4 in 1994. And it was even bigger. With 374 different diagnoses amongst its 886 pages, the new edition more than tripled the number of mental illnesses listed in the DSM-1. This rapid expansion in the number of psychiatric diagnoses may not help the patient, but it benefits many others. Once a diagnosis has been created, it enters the professional curricula. Specialists emerge to treat it. Conferences are organized around it. Research and publications cover it. Psychiatrists formulate their patient's symptoms to correspond to it. And drugs are prescribed for it. The DSM, in short, was no longer a manual, but a full-fledged industry. The DSM Although it is our Bible, it becomes the Bible and it becomes a tantamount to, uh, you know, the tablet coming down from Mount Sinai, not just for psych psychiatry and psychology, but for insurance companies, for the legal profession. It comes into play as far as uh, sentencing. It comes into play as far as custody decisions. So non-scientific information is used to make some radical, life-altering 
or life-ending decisions. The danger of all these psychiatric diseases is that anyone walking the earth today could be labeled as having a mental illness. Using the DSM, psychiatrists at Harvard University have declared that half of everyone on earth will be mentally ill in their lifetime. One prominent Harvard psychiatrist, Dr. John Rady, goes a step further, arguing no one is truly normal. Though the American Psychiatric Association has quietly acknowledged the lack of evidence for Joseph Schildkraut's chemical imbalance theory, the claim is still flogged in the media and passed on to patients every day. And although you are not likely to in the general media, psychiatrists readily admit that the disorders listed in the DSM have no proven pathology and therefore cannot be called medical diseases. If you were to be confronted with someone saying that the DSM is not backed up by science, what do you have to say about that? Oh, I would say that they're entirely right. No, the DSM is not science. I think there are non-scientific elements, political aspects of it that influence it. Yeah, absolutely. DSM-4 is still far away from science. The DSM system is far from perfect, but it's the best we have. DSM stands for diagnosis as a source of money. It brings in a lot of money. Nonetheless, the next edition, DSM-5, is in the planning stages and is due to be published in 2012. And this time, the negotiation for the next new psychiatric diseases is being held in secret. But we do know some of the new disorders under consideration. One is Internet Addiction Disorder, originally presented as a joke in a 1997 New Yorker article. Regardless, it is now claimed that 25 million people may qualify as compulsive surfers. Other disorders contemplated for DSM-5 include compulsive shopping disorder, binge eating, apathy disorder, parental alienation syndrome, relational disorder, intermittent explosive disorder, road rage, all potential disease categories with psychotropic drugs waiting to be assigned to them. According to the APA, 19 of the 27 psychiatrists on the top panel deciding on what illnesses to include in the next edition of the DSM have financial ties to drug companies. The situation got so bad that the architect of DSM-3, Robert Spitzer, and DSM-4 editor, Alan Francis, went public, warning, the APA might well be accused of a conflict of interest in fashioning DSM-5 to create new patients for psychiatrists and new customers for pharmaceutical companies. But the psychiatric community has decided not to address this issue, and for good reason. Today, psychiatric drugging rakes in over $80 billion a year for pharmaceutical companies. And with every new edition of the DSM, the diagnoses have not only expanded in number, but cast a wider net to encompass such population segments as senior citizens, the military, pregnant women, and even children. In my training, when I first started this, they told us that they would not give a bipolar diagnosis for a child under 18. Um, these days, I see children diagnosed with bipolar disorder at five and six years old. A two-year-old can be throwing a temper tantrum and then stop and be fine. Anybody that's a parent has seen that happen. That doesn't mean they're mentally ill. It means they're two-year-olds. How can you even diagnose a two-year-old as a bipolar disorder? I mean, how can you diagnose anybody as a bipolar disorder if you want to look at it that way? Because there is no such thing as bipolar disorder, not from a medical standpoint. It's not like you can find a cell in a person that shows that they have bipolar disorder. It's not like they have a fever or run a temperature, like if they had a physical illness. This is a behavioral definition only. In other words, a human being sat there and made a subjective decision that this person has this so-called condition. Today, nearly one million children are diagnosed as bipolar, making it more common than autism and diabetes combined. In 2007, half a million children and teenagers took at least one prescription for an antipsychotic, including 20,000 under the age of six. Antipsychotic drugs, powerful chemicals designed originally for only the most seriously mentally troubled, 
are now a $22.8 billion industry. If you spent days reading the newest DSM, you would be able to diagnose every human being that you ever saw. And with the diagnosis comes the treatment. The DSM most definitely helps in the prescribing of drugs. It, it uh, legitimizes the process of pulling out the prescription pad because here is this disease entity. The disease entity is addressed with this medication. And the DSM is in the service of making things reductionist into very simple, uh, simplistic ways of looking at things. That makes it easier for the pharmaceutical company to create a medication for. Uh, the only thing that we've left out of that equation is the person. Welcome back again to Green Time. I'm talking with Dr. Don Fitz. Uh, you've just watched aspects of the DVD again, and I'm gonna ask you, Don, was there anything that you would want to comment on about this DVD? Yeah, th this section of the DVD, they had a lot of good information. One of the things which I found most interesting was when they talked about homosexuality, mm -hmm. because before, I, th well, I think it was version three of the DSM manual, homosexuality mm -hmm. was a disease yes. for which you couldn't find the brain chemistry that made it a disease, but then suddenly by a vote, it, it was not a disease. And, and the DVD pointed out that a lot of times that what happens in all the categories that people are given in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, those are fads. I mean, you might see one fad coming in one year and it's diagnosed a whole lot and another fad coming in the next year. When I think what counselors and therapists really should be looking at is what are people coming to me with problems? <laughs> and, and not just what's the diagnostic fad of the year. Indeed. Okay, uh, I would ask you then, uh, before you mention how polluting the manufacture of drugs is right. in India, but also elsewhere, I guess you would say, right. uh, what could you say about medicine in general? Okay, well, I just wanted to finish up what I was saying about the pollution of drugs. It's, it's really, really bad in India. In, in the United States, the whole in, entire areas of the land, the countryside, you can't use entire rivers, don't have any life in them. Mm -hmm. people, when people are medicated over-medicated, they tend to flush the chemicals down the toilet. Yes. And, and so it goes into the sewage system. It's something that either has to be filtered out or can't be filtered out. And so the drugs are very powerful agents. And it's not just psychotropic drugs, it's any drugs. When we get drugs uh, for, for cancer, you know, if those are not really needed, those drugs are something that's very, very environmentally destructive. Yes. If, if we look at something which is absolutely parasitic, in the medical industry today, it's these insurance companies. If we had free universal health care, people would get the health care for what they need. And, but if you think of these huge insurance companies, that concrete had to, be, had to come from somewhere. That steel had to come from somewhere. The manufacturing, those, those park, enormous parking lots by insurance companies, those are taking up green space and making it much more difficult for, uh, for us to have a livable environment. And so if we just stopped doing that and just said, okay, well, you know, you get the treatment that you need, but we're not, we don't have to have 30% of medical care bills going to insurance company. That's just, just ridiculous. But some of the other things that happen in American medicine are the enormous over-treatment of patients and the under-treatment of other patients. And so there's this lack of balance that results in a huge amount of medicine, which is simply not productive for people. Absolutely. And so uh, this is a grand imbalance in terms of what the human race, the working class, would benefit from. Absolutely. I mean, we really need the, the sort of medicine that, you know, deals with pe pe people's real needs and, you know, where people can walk to their doctors, you know, not drive a car to the doctor, a lot more focus on community medicine and a lot less focus on the specialties. Okay. John, thank you very much for your interview today. Very interesting and very worthy. Okay. And we're going to wind up this segment in just a second here. <laughs> okay, great. Mm -hmm.